Hey everyone, welcome to week two uh, of Python programming. Not the direction that I would have thought that we'd be doing this in person, but you know, weather happens and you know, it's better to be safe than sorry, I guess. So um, I'm going to do the video of this week's lecture. I want to kind of go over the objectives for week two. And this way, instead of me giving you a document and saying, hey, here's a document, go ahead and complete it. Uh, read the document. I wanted to make it as, as as much activity as possible. So week two, we're going to learn about basic terminal commands in Unix. We're going to talk about how to configure and utilize Git, both locally and via GitLab. We'll discuss the uh, commands in Git that we'll use. And the commands that we use will be the basic ones that we'll use throughout the class. We'll discuss a lecture on both Git and introduction to computers which we kind of talked about Git a little bit last week, so we'll kind of like more or less go into the details of it. Uh, there will be a small assignment on Git, so part of this week's assignment, I was going to be more of a class, but to ensure that you've actually followed the directions, watched the video, I'll have a small assignment for you to complete something in Git for me after you've completed the setup at home. Now we'll also have to complete this Git setup in class because you'll have this all on your computer. So we'll have to do this eventually in class as well again. And then lastly is a syllabus quiz. So if you actually go down to, I don't, I guess I don't have it shown here. So let me uh, show it for you. Um, let me turn this off. So that would actually help exams. I'll show you a link. So now let's go here. Um, you'll have exams. Um, this is the final, so you don't have access to that. And you know what? I have that turned off. So let me just turn this off for a second. So you'll have the syllabus quiz here. Right now it's not displaying. It won't display till 8 o'clock tonight. But you'll be able to do the syllabus quiz. And um, this will, if you think you're getting a, this is midterm, it'll, it'll be modified. But anyways, you'll be able to do the syllabus quiz. You'll just click on it and click begin. There's no time frame, so you just take as much time as you want to take the quiz. There's, I think, 20 questions, two bonus questions, um, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, so that's pretty much at, on that aspect of it, okay? If you, have, if you have questions on it, you know, just shoot me an email. All right, so I'll get started with the uh, video here. All right, so uh, this week's topics are introduction, hardware and software, how computers store data, and more information on Python. So computers can be programmed, designed, designed to do any job that a program tells them to. So think of this as a computer, if you're an introduction and you've never programmed before, consider this as a, as a computer that you're actually able to develop source code on. In this case, we're using Python. So that is what we're gonna be using uh, within this uh, course. So it's just kind of talking about, you know, you can take a computer and you can program it to do just about anything you want it to do. But now in this era, we're able to use iPhones, Android devices, refrigerators, washers, dryers, vehicles, TVs, etc. It just goes on and on because everything has a computer in it. So what is a program? It's a set of instructions that a computer follows to perform a task. So for an example, let's say that, you know, the new era is Bluetooth. Let's say that you develop a device that is able to fly like uh, the drones that we have out there. But let's say that you want to develop something that's similar to a drone, but not. And you want to develop your own camera. You want to develop your own GPS. Maybe you attach your camera within there, some sort of sequence. And by using Bluetooth and software development, you can start to do what you want it to do. Okay. So that's commonly referred to software. Programmer, a person who designs and creates a test a test computer program. So that's someone who writes code. So, you know, if you develop an application like Facebook or Uber or whatever the case is, that's your programmer. Hardware, physical devices that are make up a computer. So anything on a computer. So a computer has attachments such as uh, video cards. You could have an attachment as, a, um, as an audio capability. Another thing is think of a drone. What can you attach to a drone? You could attach... Uh, different cameras and etc. So major components of a computer is a central processing unit. So that's the CPU. That's the piece in the middle 
that actually uh, basically is a, does a lot of the processing. It does all the thinking. So think of a vehicle. What would the CPU of a vehicle be? The engine. Uh, main memory. There's memory in a vehicle as well. There's memory in a computer. So that memory itself is able to store everything that you do. It's able to capture all your thoughts and processes. Secondary storage devices or you know, you have a storage device that is able to be utilized for saving information. You could have an outside device that plugs in directly through a USB, or you could have a device that plugs in directly within the computer itself. And then your input and output devices could be, well, not widely used anymore. It's like a DVD drive, but more or less input would be like your socket for your headphones, or potentially if you have a USB port, uh, maybe you have something called a Thunderbolt port, and so forth. CPU, kind of talked about it. Microprocessor, skip that. Main memory, kind of talked about it. Um, thing is, it's RAM, random access memory. Um, it's able to quickly access data and in, in, in the memory. So, like I said, let's say that you created, a, you have a program and you want to save it to the computer memory. So every time you start up, it remembers where it's at. You could do stuff like that. Secondary storage. In this day and age, in, in the past, Secondary storage is widely used. Someone will hook up a second hard drive to your computer and be able to transfer information. But nowadays, we have thumb drives that can hold a terabyte of data or so forth. And they're so small. So, you know, things have changed since this. <laughs> uh, but that could be a secondary storage. Uh, input data that computer collects people from other devices. So let's say they were writing a Python program and we're allowing the user to put input boxes or whatever the case is. That itself could be uh, some type of input. You're inputting some type of something within the code and it allows you to type it out. Uh, in this example, um, their input is keyboard, mouse, touchscreen, scanner, camera. So those could be input. Output, how images, how things are produced on the screen. So you have a phone, you click a button, what happens? Something outputs. Uh, other Examples, video display, printer, so like we mentioned, USB, and so forth. Software, can anything that be controlled by software. Uh, application software, so your computer itself, if you have, if you have, uh, think of a game, um, so you have, uh, what is it? Um, trying to think, I have a brain freeze here. Uh, Spotify, couldn't think of it. That's an application, it allows you to listen to music. Maybe you have iTunes, that's another application. System software could be Microsoft Excel, stuff like that. Uh, application software, uh, programs that make computers useful for everyday tasks. That could be anything. Now, this is word processing email games. Most of us probably with email either use it on our phone, which is an application, it's an app, or maybe we go out to a website like gmail.com, hotmail.com. Those would be applications as well, even though they're in a web browser. Uh, skip that. A uh, byte. What's a byte? So all data and computers are stored in zeros and ones. Now, when you're writing code, you're writing it in English where you're talking about if this condition equals this and this is going to happen else that. But when the computer looks at it, they're like, hey, zero, one, zero, one. It recognizes those numbers mean something to that. So if we actually all had to physically write numbers in a program, I don't think I actually, I know I wouldn't do this job. And I'm sure other people wouldn't think about doing it. So byte, just enough memory to store a letter or small number. So it's divided into eight bits. A bit is electrical component that can hold positive or negative charge, like an on-off switch. And the pattern of bits in a byte represents data stored in a byte. So position of digit J is assigned to the value two. Um, J and uh, so it's like a uh, J remainder negative one to determine the value of the binary number sum, position value is one. So byte size limits are zero to 255, and zero equals all the bits off, and 255 equals the bits on. So to store larger data, uh, you need several bytes. So, you know, we're not gonna go into details how that works, but I'll let you read through it. Um, but it's, it helps to understand the concept. So once you're actually coding, understand the bits that are being used and so forth. Uh, let's move on here. Digital uh, describes any device that stores data as a binary number. So digital could be images on your computer. 
So let's say that uh, you take uh, photos on your phone and you upload them to your computer, or maybe you take them on your camera and you take your little SD card out, throw it in your computer. That's digital. Uh, skip that. Mm, let's skip that too. This right here kind of explains um, how the process works. So you have uh, the CPU, which is a guide that sits on the motherboard, and on top of that, you don't see is something called a heat sink. And then on top of that is a fan. So it's a lot of cooling process. There's your main memory. So what it does is it fetch, fetches the next instruction in the program, decodes the instruction to determine which operation is being used. And these are type of numbers that are being switched around and then it executes the instruction performs the operation. So what happens here is like, let's say that we wrote a program, program to do something. These are the input values that the computer is getting. And once the CPU gets it, it understands and is able to ma manipulate and say, oh, okay, we're trying to accomplish this. That's kind of crazy how you think about it. If you had to write code and figure out what numbers are in sequence, it'd be very complicated. Uh, assembly language, I use the short words, mnemonics for instructions instead of binary numbers. Uh, the assembler translates assembly language to machine language, which is basically what we talked about there. Uh, so there is an older program at language called assembly that actually you have to do that. Um, low level language, uh, low level language, are, it's very powerful. So let's say for example, Uber. Uh, so the vehicles are able to drive themselves basically. They're, they're using C programming for that, for the majority of it, C programming. It's a low level language. It doesn't require much uh, bandwidth, much space and so forth, where you know, if you had Java or if you had uh, .NET or, or even Python to that degree, it's a higher level language where it requires more complex changes and it would require a lot more space and low level doesn't. Uh, keywords, predefined words used to write programs in high level language. So each keyword has a specific meaning. Uh, operators perform operations on data. So for example, math operations. So if you're doing uh, adding something, multiplying something, maybe if you're using a remainder. Uh, syntax, a set of rules to be followed when writing code. Uh, so syntax is like, for example, you'll learn in uh, Python, we'll talk about indention. It's very important to have your code automatically indented. If you don't indent it, it'll give you problems. So there are little sequences such as uh, case sensitive words as well. Statement, individual instruction used to a high level language. So a statement can be like, okay, I need you to call this method. And in this method, we're passing maybe a digital image that was copied over and maybe who copied it over and what time did this was copied and what was the size of the image and so forth. So those are examples there. Um, compiler, compiler and programming is very important. It translates the high level language program into machine language. So what it does is, let's say that you wrote this code, this awesome app that does crazy stuff, and it has like you know 25 different pages of code. What it does is once it's compiled, it's compiled to the machine so the machine can understand it. It's basically convert it into zeros and ones so the machine knows what's happening. Um, interpreter uh, translates and executes instructions of the high level language. So used by Python language, interprets one instruction at a time no separate machine uh, to do that. Source code, statements written by the programmer. So we'll talk about that. Uh, I'm gonna kinda, so this is actually a good example right here. So if you look at this right here, we wrote print hello earthling uh, in Python. The interpreter is the person in the middle. So think of it as this, like if you remember last week when I talked about, um, I talked about the business analyst, the project manager, and the software engineer. Okay, so the business analyst, an example, will be the interpreter. This guy right here will be the software engineer, and this person right here would be the, uh, um, we could say it would be the business. So uh, the person in the middle is able to talk to the software engineer and says, hey, what do you really want? And they talk in you know, a high level, it says, oh, I'm using this program, I'm using this method, and this method is gonna connect to blah, blah, blah. And the business analyst is like, oh, okay, sure. And then and then we'll say the machine language is the, uh, the uh, business, and they're like, what did they say? And then they're like, well, what they're gonna do is they're gonna take this page and when you click on this button, this is gonna appear. So what they do is they change the, uh, the, the language of how they describe it. Uh, another example is like, let's say this person right here speaks Spanish and this per person speaks English and he talks to this uh, Spanish person and says, 
what are you saying? And then he says, oh yeah, he's saying that, and they just go back and forth. So that would be an example so that the CPU can understand what it's um, interpreting, okay? So if you have questions on that, please let me know. Um, Python must be installed and configured prior to use. So we talked about installing Python last week. Uh, so the computers in the classroom hopefully um, have been installed. Uh, I've uh, reached out to tech support to get an update on that. Still waiting for that. So luckily we don't have class this week in case that would hold us back. Uh, Python um, uh, can be used in two modes. Uh, interactive mode, enter statements on the keyboard, or script mode. So next week when we actually dive in and start doing some Python, I'll show you how we can write some scripts in this uh, um, uh, idle mode. And idle mode is more like a text-based mode. And then we'll show you how we actually write some code in Python um, using the editor. Uh, when, you use, when you start Python in interactive mode, you'll see a prompt. It indicates the interpreter is waiting for a statement to be typed. So we'll actually be able to type a statement. It'll be able to pick it up. It'll, uh, it'll reappear after um, it's been executed. Let's see here. All right, so this right here, Idle, is the Integrated Development Program. It's a single program that provides tools to write, execute, and test a program. Automatically, when a Python language is installed, runs in interactive mode. Okay, so let's see here. If I can pull it up. All right, so I'm back. So what I did here is, shall hopefully you can see it here is uh, you could type in idle right there. And you see it's Python. So you'll be able to do this if you're using Windows or a Mac. I'm using a Mac here. So then I'll click on it. And you'll see that it brings up a shell right here. So this right here tells you what version of Python you're using. So what we could do is we'll talk about how we could like write some code. We could say, hey, uh, Python, tell me what seven times five is. And as you see right here, it automatically gives you a result. Okay, so um, 88 times seven gives you a result immediately. So you see how quick it is? You could use it as, you could use as a debugger. So you might have your Python code over here and you're writing your code. And then you might have this over here as a debugger. Um, you could say print um, hello all. And look at that, it prints it out. It does what you want it to do. So right now, think of it as we're providing it instructions and it's outputting uh, values back. So next week when we actually sit down and start writing some Python coding, we'll write some code that we're gonna do in class. We'll write it here in idle. And then we'll actually go back to the PyCharm. So make sure everyone has their PyCharm, PyCharm installed and ready to go. And uh, so those who bring their laptops will actually be able to start um, writing some code and going from there. So hopefully uh, the demonstration a little bit today was pretty pretty helpful and um, or the lecture per se. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna include some other videos and course videos. So in week two, I'll put a tab. This is um, something about course videos and you could watch the course videos and they'll be on how to get started with Git and so forth. So if you have any questions, you know my email, jcman at ccac.edu. Shoot me an email and we can talk about it. Uh, if not, have a great week and be safe out there. Thank you.